In this video, I'm going to talk about the second part of Robinson Crusoe. So, so he's on the ship, there's a storm, he ends up on this island and he's all by himself and there's nobody else. And he's terrified and he encounters many dangers. He has a lot of fear in the beginning. He gets over it a little bit when he sees that there's no wild beasts on the island, but he's still having to work all the time for his, for his sustenance. So he was doing fine in England and he screws that up and then he's doing, you know, okay in Brazil, but then he has to get too ambitious and he ends up in this terrible situation. He calls it the Isle of Despair. A lot of this narrative is about Robinson's suffering. It was a very popular book in the 18th century and it is one of the books from the 18th century that people continue to read. Um, to this day, people read it, you're reading it. Uh, it's, um, it's fascinated people for centuries. So part of, part of what we might think is interesting about it, what is appealing about it is just reading about somebody else suffering, which doesn't really sound very nice, but that is part of the appeal of Robinson Crusoe. And Edmund Burke theorized this about, thought about why we like certain narratives and why we don't like others. Actually, he was talking about aesthetics, about why we like certain um, visual objects. And he said that we as human beings are drawn to suffering. And he argues that, um, that God created humans to be sympathetic. The reason why we're drawn to suffering is to exercise our sympathy. So here would be an example from, I mean, this is obviously not an example from Burke, but you know how like back in the old days when we used to drive on the Beltway, you're driving on the Beltway and there's a car crash and the people who are not in the lane of the car crash also have a traffic jam because everybody's looking at it. And Burke noticed this in the 18th century that people love to look at disaster and other people's suffering. And sometimes I think Robinson Crusoe is like that, that it's just like us being riveted on someone else's suffering. And Burke had an optimistic explanation, which is that God wants to force us to look at other people's suffering so that we come to some sympathy for them. But he did notice that this is something that humans are, are drawn to. And if you've ever driven on the Beltway, you will agree with Burke that they're drawn to watching other people suffer. That's part of part of the appeal of, of Robinson Crusoe. But Robinson also tries to, um, I mean, he goes through phases where he's just enduring, where he's just miserable, where he's lamenting his misery. But then he tries to find a way to stabilize his emotions. And this is to me one of my favorite parts of the novel when he makes this chart called the chart of good and evil. And notice that he's using these terms, good and evil, the way Hobbes uses them, not in a moral Christian way, but a good thing being something that gives me pleasure, something that I'm grateful for. And an evil thing is something that gives me pain, something that I would prefer to avoid. So he makes this chart and he tries to balance everything that's bad that's happened to him against spinning it in some kind of positive way, which I, which I think is really fascinating. And I think um, that really is what keeps him going all those years on, on the island is this ability to kind of think, well, you know, I'm on this island, I'm all by myself. It's terrible, there could be wild beasts. I'll be hungry all the time. Well, on the other hand, I'm, I'm alive and all my other friends are dead. So why did I survive and they didn't? And you know, the island is really not so bad that there aren't any terrible beasts on it. And um, you know, things are growing pretty well. And so, so one of the most wonderful parts of this narrative 
is when he settles down to taking care of himself and figuring out like I need a pot how could I make a pot and um, this painstaking slow sort of um, focus on building something and building things little by little and getting frustrated because they don't work at first and then becoming happy because then they do start to work so he's so he's alone and this is also part of the um you know whole 18th century and the 17th century too there's a fascination with what is the nature of human beings and what would a human being be like if there were no other human beings around and of course you know robinson crusoe is kind of a false experiment in that sense because he was raised with human beings and he takes all this stuff from the ship that was obviously, you know, somebody else made the tools that he takes and the clothes that he takes. But still, it is a kind of consideration of what, hap what emotions are useful when you're outside of the social. And so an another great scene is where he finds money and he, you know, recognizes that this money has actually kind of been his downfall. Like that's why he's there in the first place because he's greedy and he's never satisfied with what he had. And he, you know, rejects this money, but you know, then he takes it anyway, just in case. You take that as optimistic and that he knows that he'll rejoin some sort of social situation again. But um, he, he believes that, um, he comes to believe that there must be a reason behind what happened to him. And he tries to figure out if there's a providence operating or not. And he spends a lot of time thinking about that. And there's some really wonderful scenes like where he uh, finds this empty bag and he shakes it out. And, um, and then he comes by and he sees like corn is miraculously growing there. And then he's, convinced that there's a God. And then he remembers, oh yeah, I shook out a bag there. So maybe it wasn't God. Maybe it was just like a few pieces of corn left in the bag a lot of time. I mean, that's one thing very interesting about this novel is that it it is a very different sense of time as you would get in most other narratives. You know, he's not, he's not really in a hurry for anything. He doesn't have any deadlines. He's not developing in any way. He's not getting married, having children, moving, for, moving, moving forward in life. He's kind of static, except that he's building up his comforts and learning how to do things. And he, he, he actually argues that anyone who really put their mind to it could figure out how to make things like, like pots and, um, and his cave that he learns to take care of. So philosophers in the 17th and 18th century were fascinated with what man was like in nature. And again, like this isn't really man in nature. You know, I think we were talking about earlier how for Hobbes, if you were born without any humans, you wouldn't have any emotions at all because emotions are all social. And so clearly Robinson has leftover emotions, but he does notice that his, his social emotions fade and he discovers other internal emotions. So that's part of, part of his journey in this narrative is discovering internal emotions and something that maybe he can take with him. Of course, also a lot of, a lot that's political in this narrative too. There's, um, Defoe is clearly influenced by Locke, who was also interested in the state of nature versus the state of society. John, John Locke, the philosopher at the end of the 17th century. And Locke argued that property comes from adding labor to nature and that when so if you find you know if you find an apple tree and you actually put in your labor by picking the apples then the apple is yours and so 
this was used as an argument to justify colonial possession because the argument was that the natives there weren't actually cultivating the land. And so Robinson spends a lot of time actually in cultivation. And there are lots of comments throughout about how he, you know, sometimes he looks on the bright side, but sometimes he looks like kind of absurdly on the bright side where he says like, I'm like the king of this island and I have total power over my parrot and my cat. <laughs> and people have argued about how we're supposed to take those comments. You know, does he really see himself as, as a king or is there a kind of parody of um, that level of arrogance or is he all by himself and going a little crazy or it, does he being Robinson kind of think it's funny you know that that Defoe is making a joke of it yeah you could be king if there's nobody else around but what you know what good is it so so you can think about that how you interpret that it's been interpreted in very various ways as either very satirical or completely serious um I, I tend to think it's somewhat somewhat satirical, especially because when he's talking about how he's at the the table and he's got all his courtiers around him and they're his dog and his goat and you know I think I think it's I think it's supposed to be funny, um, and it's supposed to be kind of um, a satire of kings, not of Robinson Crusoe, and not a sort of um, imperial impulse that Robinson has. So, so the relationship between this narrative and colonialism is, is very complicated because just for really broad strokes, I mean, you could see it as glorifying colonialism because he does, you know, survive, does more than survive. I, can't exactly say flourish because he is miserable but he does he he is able to survive and build some build some wealth even though his wealth is really just like a store of food and some tamed goats so he's able to uh, establish himself there even though he's not happy um, on the other hand everything that's um all the colonial impulses really end very poorly here i mean very unhappily you know like he calls this place the island of despair he does definitely does not want to be there uh you could see his being swept as the island as a punishment for his ambition i've always thought it was significant that he gets swept onto the island specifically on a mission to trade for slaves. So if that's a punishment, then part of what he was doing was um, something, something, something bad. And, you know, although he is in Brazil, he's definitely a colonist. I mean, the Portuguese are not, not native to Brazil. They're, they were, you know, conquerors and imported African slaves for sugar plantations and Robinson Crusoe is part of that. A lot of the pleasure of the middle section of the novel is just watching him make things and before that it's the suffering but at a certain point it turns to creativity and um, a sort of unalienated labor, labor that is directly producing a thing rather than working for money and trading that money for a thing. So there's, there's great pleasure in, um, for Robinson in that section.